In 1985, UC Hastings building engineers pulled off part of the ceiling on their new building storage space at 100 McAllister Street. What they discovered were the high vaulted ceilings of a great Gothic cathedral. For almost 60 years it had been hidden behind drop ceiling and wall plaster, unseen and untouched. Finally, the lost cathedral of the Tenderloin had been found. In the 1920s, three San Francisco Methodist churches sold their assets and pooled their resources to build a great church near the new city hall. Their plan was to build an adjoining luxury hotel whose revenue would support the church. It was to become the tallest hotel west of Chicago, standing 28 stories high. The Methodists wanted a hotel project away from downtown San Francisco, away from the center, center of the Tenderloin District, away from the, quote, bad influences, unquote, of the uh, city. And so they chose this area, which, was very, which is very close to the Civic Center. The hotel, as you know, was the, called originally the William Taylor Hotel. It was named after a famous preacher in 19th century San Francisco who was himself a 49er. And when San Francisco was nothing but a small enclave of buildings around Portsmouth Square in what is now today's Chinatown and Financial District, the time was surrounded on four sides by gambling hells, by houses of prostitution, by swearing and drinking and drunken miners and gamblers. And what he would do is he would come into Portsmouth Square and he would start singing. And it was said by uh, the historical accounts of the time that he had such a beautiful voice the people would stop their gambling and come out into Portsmouth Square just to listen to him sing. And then he had his audience and he would start preaching to them. The William Taylor Hotel opened in 1930, just as the Great Depression was taking its hold on the country. It was a bad time for opening a hotel. In four years, the Methods plan failed and the venture went bankrupt. In 1937, the banks foreclosed on the property and new owners acquired the building, renaming it the Empire Hotel. They realized that they were going to have to have a draw, something that would draw people to the hotel during the bad economic times that would make people willing to spend money in spite of it. The way they did that was they decided to put a world-class bar in the hotel. Unfortunately, in San Francisco, the blue laws mandated that no bar could be closer than 200 feet to a church. And unfortunately, the church was right in the building, on the ground floor. The only place they could put a bar that was 200 feet away from the church was up in the penthouse, and that's what they did. And that's how the Sky Room got started. This is my father, Edgar D. Rosenberg, and dad became co-manager of this hotel. He also invented the Sky Room, the first Sky Room on Earth, and I'm very proud of him, and I wish he were still alive. And I was with Dad when he said they first wanted to call it the New Yorker, and somebody had already taken that name. And so they... Uh, settled for the empire, and then the sky room. And dad had a bug up his nostril for this. He really wanted to get going on it. And it was the sky room, actually, that the military people first came to for their last drinks before leaving San Francisco for the drinks and for the world-class view. It was the first skyscraper penthouse bar in the nation, and it was immediately a profit-generating success, but not for long. Two years later, the Mark Hopkins Hotel opened its top-of-the-mark restaurant and bar. It replaced the Sky Room as the fashionable place to take a date for a high-rise cocktail. The Sky Room of the Empire Hotel wasn't enough to keep the hotel profitable. It was failing when the federal government requisitioned the building for wartime activity in 1941. The furniture of the old Empire Hotel was also sold to the government to be used in Japanese internment camps. 
During the war, most of the building was used as a military billet and a selective service station. After the war, the federal government turned the building into offices and the old church became the local headquarters for the Internal Revenue Service. Holes were punched in the ceiling of the church so that a drop ceiling could be suspended to hide the religious decor and grand architecture. Glamorous luster gave way to utilitarian grind. The Selective Service Bureau, you know, the Draft Bureau, moved up to the 16th floor at some point after World War II. And the reason I know this is because this was where I had to report in 1970 when I was reporting to the Selective Service Bureau. It was one of those buildings, you know, every city has them, certain buildings that almost everybody goes to at least once in their lives. Taxes, selective service, anybody who had anything to do with some federal agency was sooner or later going to have to come to this building. In 1977, most of the federal offices moved three blocks west into the federal building on Golden Gate Street. For the next four years, the building stood completely vacant. For UC Hastings, the building was a perfect fit for a desperate student housing shortage. Bought and refurbished in 1981, it now provides 252 apartment units housing 280 students in addition to classrooms, office space, athletic facilities, and of course, the Sky Room with its panoramic views. UC Hastings presently has three buildings and soon uh, in the next two years we'll have another one. The classroom building and the uh, administration building, though the spaces inside are really quite uh, lovely and, and, um, and very nice, are still a bit on the utilitarian side. There's nothing that we have that's as charming and individual as the tower. And we really would like to make the tower one of the sort of iconic images that people have. When they think of Hastings, we want them to think about San Francisco and this marvelous building, the tower, brimming with all sorts of uh, activities, from intellectual activity of studying and study groups to um, attending productions in the Great Hall, and working out in the gym, uh, all, of those, all of those things. And so the tower is very close to our, to our hearts. After 50 years of a tumultuous and uncertain history, the building has finally found its purpose as the housing pillar for one of the great academic institutions of San Francisco.